Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to LSE. Um, my name is Charles Goodhart, and I'm an ancient relic of the Financial Markets Group. I'm delighted to be able to welcome my friend for, for many years, Paul Tucker. Just a relic. <laughs> Not as much of a relic as I am. Anyhow, Paul is a fellow of the Harvard Kennedy School and chair of the Systemic Risk Council, which has to be differentiated from the Systemic Risk Center that's here. Previously, Paul was Deputy Governor at the Bank of England and has been involved in many august committees. The title of his talk this evening is Unelected Power, the Quest for Legitimacy in Central Banking and the Regulatory State. Uh, for those of you who use Twitter, which I'm not sure what the hell it is, in the audience, the hashtag for tonight is hashed LSE Tucker. Uh, that's, the high, that's, the, that's the high point of my career. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, please put your mobiles on silent so as not to disrupt the event, which is being recorded and will hopefully be made available in due course as a podcast and video. There will be a question and answer session after the lecture, but please wait for the microphone to get to you before starting to ask your question. And when you ask your question, could you precede it by saying who you are and where you come from? Now, there'll also be an opportunity to get a copy of Paul's book at the end of the proceedings. There are lots of copies out there. If you want to get a copy, you can then bring it in and get Paul to sign it. Though there may be such a queue that you have to be early. It's uh, like a bank run, first come, first served. Anyhow, um, that's enough of me. So Paul, over to you. It's a delight to have you here. Thank you very much, Charles. It's slightly disturbing that so many good friends should be in the audience and not have better things um, to do. Th th this book, um, Unelected Power, is not a book that is directly about economic policy or financial policy. It, it, it's indirectly about that. It's a, it's a book about the allocation of state power and therefore about the design and constraints on um, policy institutions, and in particular, economic and financial policy institutions. I, I will say something about central banks in the second part of my um, talk, but to the extent that I end up being time constrained, I will cut off the central banking material, not least because I don't think that's actually the, the most important part of the, the book. M the book could have been, had I not been a former central banker, the book might have been subtitled um, technocracy should retreat in the interests of preserving our system of government and of preserving technocracy um, itself. Um, there, there is a debate underway um, more or less everywhere about technocracy versus um, populism. And, and the, the standard attack, and there are many books um, being produced on this, many really, really excellent books about the problems of, of populism and about the threats of a kind of form of illiberal um, democracy. I, I'm more concerned, in a way, about the problems of a kind of undemocratic um, liberalism. And, and I think part of that, of course, the big, the big causes are flat growth and growing inequality. But I think that a contributory factor has been technocratic overreach, or, or more precisely, um, our society's um, not being careful enough about what should be delegated um, to unelected officials who are insulated um, from, from politics. And I, I, I worry that this um, will damage, is a slow motion threat to allegiance to our system of, of government. And throughout I'm talking about healthy democracies. I'm not talking about countries that are on the kind of cusp of being a healthy democracy. I'm not talking about countries like um, China, I'm talking about the main advanced economy, um, healthy democracies that draw on 
traditions um, and political values that go back two to three hundred years. And the, the book is essentially about what our shared values um, mean for unelected um, power. The, the, it was prompted, of course, by my own experience. Central bankers, today's central bankers have become the poster boys and girls of unelected power. They, they rank as the um, third pillar of unelected power alongside the judiciary and the, the military. And this comparison is relatively rarely made. Charles, in fact, um, a few years ago now, did write um, a paper comparing the Supreme Court um, with, uh, with central banking. Um, but it's rarely been explored, and even, even rarer um, are comparisons with the military, which came to my mind because it so happened that a friend of a friend was made a general on the same weekend that I was made um, a deputy governor. And I found, he's now the head of the armed forces here, and I found talking to Nick about his experience of the interaction between unelected officials and politics incredibly instructive. His world, of course, is not insulated from politics, and it's not meant to be. I was meant to be in a world that was insulated um, from politics. So the central banks have become the poster childs of this. During the crisis, they used their balance sheets as almost never um, before. And many of you in, in this room will know about um, that. But just as importantly, they, they became, all of the major central banks are again regulators. Powers returned to the Bank of England and it was given new powers. More importantly, because it's more important, the ECB was made a, a regulator and a bank supervisor, and the Federal Reserve, which had already been a supervisor, got increased regulatory powers um, via Dodd-Frank. And, and this, has, this has two effects. One is it's quite controversial. Um, and secondly, it means that the old literature on why central banks should be independent um, is it doesn't suffice. You, you have to open up a, a kind of right, a, a parallel debate on the regulatory state, which is highly contested, especially in the United States um, of America. Quite a big book was written a few years ago um, with the title, and I approximate, is, is the administrative state unlawful? And, and this book was taken seriously by what I would call the constitutionalist right. So the, the, an underlying theme of the book is, is that legitimacy matters. And, and I'm not going to talk this evening about how I conceive of legitimacy. Actually, I think that's one of the two most important chapters of the book. What I want to say is, is why I think it, it, it matters. I, I think it matters because legitimacy gives resilience to the system of whatever system of government one has, in our case, representative democracy under the rule of law. And the reason resilience matters is because just as there is market failure, there is government failure. Every aspect of government that you can think of will eventually mess up, and it will mess up in ways that hurt citizens, um, on, or actually sometimes in a major, major way, such as the, the financial crisis. And the key, the key feature of representative democracy for me is it separates how we as citizens feel about the government from how we feel about the system of government. The point is obvious, but massive. Um, when government messes up, we vote out the people um, that have messed up without withdrawing or qualifying our allegiance to the system of government. Indeed, it's the ability to do that that partly underpins our allegiance to the system of government. Well, you couldn't do that with me, and you couldn't do it with Charlie, and you couldn't do it with Charles when he was at the Bank of England. You can't do it with the unelected people. That's the whole point. And so the more and more of our governance that is in the hands of unelected people, the, the less and less the, the, the key point about our system of government starts to become qualified. And this will be a room drawn from all over the world. I will assert, I, I could back up, I think, that the marginal lawmaker in the United States is an unelected regulator or an unelected judge. And the reason for that is that Congress has incentives to pass statutes that are vague or merely commissions to regulatory agencies to fill out the law and essentially decide um, high policy. Now, what is, is striking? I nearly said strange. I don't think it's strange. What is striking is that <clears throat> 
In the traditions of constitutionalism that have shaped the world that we live in over the past 250 years, almost nothing is said about the administrative state. Now, that's, that's, in one sense, that's not very striking, because there was no such thing, really, as the administrative state when Madison and Jefferson and Hamilton were shaping their constitution, or when the French constitution was, was initially written after the revolution and rewritten during the 19th century and into the 20th century. One rare exception is, is Germany. Um, of course, because its basic law was only, was only written after the Second World War. The, the, the German basic law does make provision for the administrative state, and it is quite clear on the matter. It says that all administration shall be under ministerial control. Um, so there is no room um, um, for independent agencies, the topic of my book, under the German constitution. And for anyone that's thinking of the Bundesbank, for what it's worth as an aside, there was a contested debate until the Maastricht Treaty about whether or not the Bundesbank was independent de jure rather than just um, de facto. Um, but that's not the most interesting thing about Germany. The most interesting thing about Germany for me is that um, my experience of dealing with certain German agencies, and I don't mean the Bundesbank, is that they were de facto independent. Um, of ministers. So Germany, even where the administrative state is provided for in terms, it doesn't actually cater for degrees of insulation from day-to-day -day politics. The, the country that I have concluded has probably thought about this most over recent decades is, initially to my surprise, um, is France. Um, the French constitution um, puts all administration under the control of the Prime Minister um, with the emergency powers of the President in the, in the background. Um, but the Constitutional Court carved out space for independent agencies and defined them as beyond reach of ministerial direction or control. I mean, a really strong definition of independent agencies that actually would outlaw some of the um, override powers over the UK institutional independent agencies that are held by um, British ministers. Um, and it, it isn't just a judicial debate. A few years ago, the, the French Senate produced a scathing report about French independent um, agencies. And a few years after that, the French Assembly, with support from the administration, um, passed a law that provided a generic framework for independent agencies, and in fact struck off a few, decided they didn't need to be independent, that there had been an overshooting. Um, the, the UK, of course, is, has been tremendously flexible. In fact, in, in, in terms of de facto politics, we shifted from a world where the idea of agencies being outside of ministerial control was anathema to it being all the fashion. And here are a few facts, um, some drawn from my past area, some, some not. Did you know that the Financial Conduct Authority is formally more independent than the Bank of England? Did you know that the Financial Conduct Authority is more independent than the SEC? Um, did you know that Ofcom, um, which is responsible for media regulation, combines um, the regulation of not only the, the economics of telecom slash media, but also the content of that, whereas France, across a small stretch of water, had a debate about that 20 years ago and concluded that um, any such agency that regulated both the content of the media and also the economics of the media would be too powerful and therefore it was vital to keep them apart. Did you know that when um, the Clementi report came out on the regulation, and David Clementi is a, is a friend of mine, um, came out on the regulation of the BBC, should they continue to self-regulate or should it be a new independent regulator or should it be Ofcom where things um, landed? There was no discussion whatsoever about whether Ofcom um, was fit for purpose to be so powerful. I am not making an ad feminem point at all, re recognizing that there is a single um, de facto policymaker um, in Ofcom. And I, and I could go on. So let me then define independent agencies. I define them agencies as agencies that have powers delegated from their parliament or congress and are insulated from the day-to-day -day politics of both elected branches of, of government. So using 
US examples. It helps to use US examples because of the stronger separation of powers there. The SEC, the Commodities and Futures Trading Commission, the um, antitrust body, the communications regulator, they are not independent on this definition because they are subject to annual budget appropriations. I think I've probably known every chair of the SEC since the mid-1980s, and they are immensely sensitive to the ebb and flow of sentiment in Congress. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. In some respects, I think it's a, um, a good thing. The Consumer Finance Protection Bureau that um, was created by Dodd-Frank, it is an, an independent agency on my definition, but for what it's worth, it should not be on the criteria that I go to set out, which doesn't turn at all on the substance of CFPB policy. It turns on the, the structure of the agency with a, with a single head and multiple objectives, all of which um, are vague. And for those of you that are American or follow American politics, you will know that this is a very big deal um, that is making its way um, parts of that, of what I've just been discussing, will make their way to the Supreme Court um, asking the question whether the, whether the delegation was constitutional. Both the Federal Reserve and the Federal Deposit um, Insurance Corporation um, are independent on, on my definition. What are the necessary attributes of independence? Um, control over delegated policy instruments, job um, security, that merely means that the president can't get out of bed and, and sack you, as Franklin Roosevelt tried with the commissioner of the FTC in the 30s, but the court ruled that he couldn't do that. And budgetary autonomy. I, I, I don't think you necessarily, uh, I, don't think, I don't think independence is undermined if you have to go and get political endorsement or um, a decision, political decision for your budget every five years or six years or seven years, as the Bank of England has to do. It's kind of the frequency of political budget approval that ties you in to day-to-day -day, um, politics. So what are, what are the justifications um, for delegation with insulation? And I, I'm just going to go through one. If you, somebody, Frank Viebert, I don't know whether he's in the audience, he wrote a, a, um, a great book a few years ago saying this is all about expertise. And this echoed the perhaps the most famous person in the Amer American administrative state created during the New Deal, James, James Landis, who was a dean of the Harvard Law School, was on the SEC, was one of the architects of the SEC, was on the Federal Trade um, Commission. And his view, which he set out in a, in a book, was that it's all about expertise. And for what it's worth, I don't think that works at all. You could have a body of experts that gives advice, to now use the vernacular of the UK, to ministers who decide. I mean, that's Charlie is on the OBR. Charlie doesn't take decisions about fiscal policy. He, take, he makes independent judgments about the fiscal outlook, and ministers make the decisions. The Bank of England, um, between 1991-92 and 1997, advised the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and in truth, behind the Chancellor of the Prime Minister, um, on monetary policy. Um, and that advice was, was, was published. Um, and, you, and actually, it was a better system than the one had gone before it. it it's, it's not enough that to be expert. It's necessary to be expert, obviously, but it's not enough to be um, expert. And by, and by the way, I'll say this just as an aside, you need an expert community. You need a community outside the agency that is capable of scrutinizing the agency. I mean, if you had only six experts in the country and five of them were appointed to the Independent Regulatory Commission, um, that would fail my test because it would be impossible to generate um, decently rich public um, debate um, about it. The, the, the root of the positive case for delegation is one that will be familiar to anybody who's been involved with monetary policy or followed monetary policy over the last quarter of a century, which is credible commitment, government making policies that will be trusted and, and believed and the effect that has on expectations and on um, behavior. And it's, it's interesting to think about why, why insulated technocrats should be better at committing than, than politicians. And it's not enough that the, well, the politician will, will be liable to break their promise because they will always put short the short-term welfare of the people first, 
because they're going to be running for re-election. And I can remember that. I can remember prime ministers phoning up the Bank of England and sit from, from around the world, sometimes on foreign tours, and, and ordering that interest rates um, be cut. Um, I mean, that, that is something I know for sure, because I took the call from the Chancellor's office when I was Governor Lee Pemberton's um, private secretary. But that's not enough. Why, should, why, why doesn't the technocrat walk off the, the ranch? Well, it's got to be possible to harness the technocrat to their caring about their public um, reputation and their professional reputation, a society that is incapable of bestowing esteem, of bestowing honor, if you like. And for those of you that are more p political theorists in the room, so there's a, there's a, I'm drawing there on kind of Republican theory rather than liberal theory, it doesn't get going. Um, and so these people have to care about their standing and they have to be set an objective where they're standing um, depends upon the achievement um, of the objective. The, the, the trouble with that is, is that it could apply to almost the whole of government, as, as um, Alan Blinder famously challenged everybody in an article in Foreign Affairs in 1997, if credible commitment is, is the root of this, well, why not, as he said, um, make, create far more bodies like the Federal Reserve spread over far more um, areas of government. And I've never been able to decide whether Alan was being completely serious or whether this was tongue in cheek. And I, and I actually, I think he has, a, I think both. Um, now, of course, we all know the answer. Everybody in the room knows the answer. It's completely instinctive. It's, oh my God, there are some things that we want politi elected politicians to decide. We want them to decide distributional things. We want them to decide, make the really big choices about values, about what kind of society that we live in. We don't want Charles and, and the other Charles and I to decide those things. Why? Well, I, actually, I, one can say this in this country because that's what, exactly what Simon de Montfort challenged in the 13th century. And you know, these, these things are deep, deep in the fabric of our um, beliefs. Of course, I probably won't discuss this later. This, this is why when people say QE has involved um, distributional choices. It is such a profound um, challenge. Um, so, what's, so I'm going to set out some principles for for delegation, and they will they will have three components, and I will only sketch them, and then I will say some say something about a few examples, and maybe something about central banking. Um, we need we need criteria for whether to delegate to an insulated agency at all. We need um, what I call design precepts for how to do so. And then we face the big question of should these insulated agencies be allowed to have more than one mission, which is a massive question for the post-crisis um, central banks. And I hope you can see this. You can think of the results as um, occupying one of five um, positions. I mean, if, if you, if you delegate to an independent agency and it satisfies the principles I'm going to set out, or something like them, some other set of principles that command support in the community, then, then one has democratically legitimate welfare enhancement. Um, if you delegate to an independent agency and they don't satisfy the principles but could, um, then you have a legitimacy problem, but that it's one that could be remedied, could be remedied cleanly by the parliament, or um, the bosses of the independent agency should try and synthesize um, as best as best they can. Um, moving towards the, the principles. To give you an example of why that matters, the Federal Reserve recent, a few years ago set out its objective for monetary policy. They did not publicly consult on it. They should have done, by my lights. When I've talked to them about this, the people were involved, they said they talked to various important congressmen and women behind closed doors. And my response to them as, as professional friends, and in some cases as friends, is, well, that wasn't enough. I mean, you know, it's not enough for you to decide your objectives behind closed doors. We need to be able to see what's going on. Not everyone in the room will agree with that, so that's why I give it as um, an example. If you've delegated to an independent agency that cannot satisfy the principles, and there may be some in this country, um, that's a legitimacy problem that cannot be remedied. If you have an agency that's under political control, but it could satisfy the principles, it's likely that there will be a welfare opportunity cost because the benefits of credible commitment won't be reaped. 
Um, and I think there are some examples of that in the United States and probably in continental Europe. Obviously, if you're under political control and you couldn't remotely satisfy the principles, that's a kind of pretty sensible place to, 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 to be. So there, there, you know, there are two corners where it's comfortable to be, and the other, the other parts of the matrix, some can be remedied, and some are just a bad place um, to be. And actually, I would like to see all democratic countries do an audit against these principles or something like these principles. And I have read most of the select committee reports on this from this country and other countries. And they talk about these issues, but they never go systematically through all of the agencies and assess whether they live up to um, our, our values. So let me quickly run through the um, criteria um, for whether to delegate. Well, one is that there should be broadly settled public preferences. And that sounds so anodyne. Um, as to amount to nothing. And let me give you an example why I don't think it is. If you think about environmental policy, particularly in the United States at the moment, there are a lot of people um, in politics and citizens who are really angry about um, the policies of the EPA and the, and the new director of the EPA. But the truth is there are lots of people um, that are happy with it as well. This is highly contested. Whereas if you asked, um, is there a constituency out there for high and variable inflation, I, I would suggest that there isn't. I, I think when I was a young man or a boy, I think there were people that thought that was worth having occasionally because maybe you could generate some more growth. Even, even less, and I don't think this is an absurd point to make, I don't think there's a constituency out there for financial crises. Could we have them more frequently, or when they come along, could they be bigger, um, um, please? So. I mean, there's a, there's a delusion in those examples which people will appreciate. But it's an important, it's not a nothing test. Um, I've talked about the importance of there being a problem of credible commitment and not delegating big choices, not effects, but choices on distributional um, issues. So how about how? Um, so a lot of work in my book and where I'm going is done by the first uh, of these, which is that the legislature or elected politicians should set a clear objective that can be monitored. So this rules out multiple objectives unless something prescriptive is said about how to make the trade-off, and it rules out um, vague objectives. And by the way, this, 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 if you have such an objective, it doesn't just underpin independence from politics. It, in, it underpins independence from industry and being captured by um, private um, interests because people can monitor you against a clear objective. It also, um, again, for those of you that are American or follow America, it also puts a bit of a nail in the personnel is policy doctrine, which is actually any president can, can sway any area of public policy by who they appoint. Well, you can't if, if, if the people that are appointed are going to be held accountable um, against an objective that can be monitored. And going back to the first criterion, the public as a whole care about um, um, that objective. A second one is that there should be um, one person, one vote after deliberation. So this, this would knock out all of the offs in this country, which have director generals with a kind of oversight board. And I talked to the members of some of the oversight boards. And I said, are you a policymaker? And they said, yes. I said, did you go to a confirmation hearing? They said, no. I said, do you ever testify on the policy choices? They said, no. I said, are your votes on policy published? They said, no. I then, in one case, I asked a minister, who is the policymaker at the, at the off such and such? And they named, of course, the director general. We have independent um, agencies with one policymaker. By, I think that is a concentration of power that um, goes against the grain of our Republican principles, um, avoiding concentrations um, of power. I think it um, exposes us either to legitimacy problems or to ministerial de facto um, override. And which of those occurs depends on which country um, one's in. Um, the third is going to sound slightly highfalutin. It's important. Yeah, um, to underline that my principles aren't just Republican. Um, liberal principles are embedded as well. Power should not be used in a way that interfere unduly with liberal um, freedoms. This is, of course, a version of the German 
legal doctrine um, coming from Prussia of proportionality. Um, this, by the way, deals a savage blow to the most popular macroprudential instrument um, being used all over the world um, and a power that I think the Bank of England now um, has. Now, just in, I talked about clear and monitorable objectives. I've got, what, five agencies here, all from the United States. Some are not at all independent, some are semi-independent, and some are independent. And if you just spend a moment glancing at those objectives, you'll see that they, all of their objectives is vague. Um, the FCC, pursue the public convenience, interest, or necessity, so as to provide a fair, efficient, and equitable distribution. The Energy Commission, um, utility-type charges that are just and reasonable. The SEC has to deliver a combination of investor protection, fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and capital formation. The Federal Reserve and its banking supervision, safety and soundness of banking groups. N none, of, none of that. I mean, you know, this is setting your own goalposts. How did you do? I did really well. Dude, I tried really hard, and I did, and I did really um, well. Better, better to have policy under the direct control, almost, of, of elected people. So carrying on with the design precepts, I think it's important for independent agencies to publish their operating principles. Um, no such thing had been published for a lender of last resort. Um, operations before the financial crisis, and in most countries it hasn't been published. Now, the debate about whether the Federal Reserve should follow a rule when doing monetary policy should be thought of as, as a particular manifestation of this gap. Um, fifth, um, that there should be sufficient transparency to allow accountability of politicians for the design of the regime and of the technocrats for the um, delivery of the regime. I think I'm going to leave emergencies because it's such a big, a big topic. It, for what I will just say that in the United States, um, a lot of people, particularly in the technocratic center, soft left, but and also just about soft right, will will typically say the only the only part of government um, that can possibly work in a in a crisis is the executive branch, and in fact the independent agencies, and especially the Federal Reserve, and we must must just let them do whatever is necessary to save the country, and I, I disagree with that. So just to give a concrete example, in our continent, when, when Mario um, saved the European project um, by saying he'd do whatever it takes, I think that he should have gone to the Council of Ministers in intergovernmental mode beforehand to, ask, to check that they wanted their project saved. And I do not think this is a trivial point. I do not think it would have been easy to do it because of the risk of leaks, but I think that the acrimony that the ECB meets in Germany would have been somewhat less had he um, done that. And he's a great man who has saved the second biggest economic area in the world, but I don't think this is, is a kind of fiddly point, given the, the kind of political tension around the ECB. Um, I will come back to multiple mission extraints. Um, in questions, perhaps. Let me give some examples. Let me give a few away from central banking. So take antitrust. I mean, in many respects, this is the single most important, important part of economic policy in any market economy, that what, what some of us did for a living it provides a platform for stability. I mean, you ought to be able to take that for granted, even though that's proved not to be true, whereas actually the competitive conditions in a market economy are, are absolutely vital and you would and, and yet you could have you could have a whole range of objectives for antitrust policy and would you believe and i think you should believe that at the beginning of the 20th century when president wilson was working on antitrust policy with with the man who became justice brandeis their target was not only economic um, excessive economic power it was also excessive political power economic power generating political power in the debates amongst the auto liberals in Germany after the Second World War that kind of um, fueled um, the initial policies of the antitrust body there, one of the, which, which itself informed what's become the um, part of the European um, Commission, they also were focused on political power. Why? Because um, excessive economic business power had underpinned the Nazi regime during the 
um, 1930s. And, and the Harvard School doctrine, which kind of was rather crude, where you had just some cutoffs, if you have more than X percent of a market, it must per se be um, illegal. Um, that, of course, is kind of pretty flawed um, economics and was displaced by the Chicago School progressively during the 1970s. For anyone who was in Britain during that period, we, on our television screens were the, were the great scenes of, of Judge Bork um, failing to be confirmed um, by the Senate as a Supreme Court um, justice. The point here is the shift from Harvard doctrine to Chicago School doctrine, which is a major shift, not just in techniques, but in high policy. That was taken by judges. That wasn't taken by people in the administration. It didn't go near Congress. That was taken by judges. And I don't think, even though I quite like the policy in many respects, I don't think it should be. And I think in a period where we're seeing um, concentrated political power in the private sector because of concentrated economic power, we are living through the effects of choices made by unelected um, judges. Here's one from my own past. So if you look at um, the so-called Basel core principles for banking supervision, they more or less start, well, almost the first thing they say is bank supervisors must be independent. And the equivalent international body for securities regulators says securities regulators must be independent. And the IMF has this in one of their codes, and they go around um, the world saying um, everyone should make these regulators independent. If you, if you ask bank supervisors whether they should tell anybody what they do, they will say absolutely vital not to do so. This has changed recently a bit, but you know, the, the 50 or 60 years up to two th spring 2009, absolutely essential not to tell anybody what's going on. Indeed, at one point, the bank supervisors in Eddie George's bank locked the doors so the rest of us couldn't get into the bank supervision department. So sensitive um, was it. So, you, so this is the ultimate trust us regime. Make us independent. We can't tell you what you're doing. Um, when we mess up, as we in inevitably will occasionally, um, sorry. I mean, just, this is just one of the, something has to give. Either the independence has to give or the transparency. Um, has to give, and why, how this point wasn't made everywhere around the world. I mean, I feel slightly ashamed looking back, um, actually. So here's another example, and this is a more interesting one in a sense. Um, so if you take securities regulation, the, the SEC, as I said, has um, responsibility for protecting investors, maintaining fair and orderly and efficient markets, and facilitating capital formation, the, F, the FCA and the former FSA broadly similar, equally ranking objectives. And President Trump recently appointed a chair who will tilt policy um, quite a way, I think, towards facilitating capital formation away from protecting um, investors. So cl classic case for not being independent. So you know, the SEC isn't. Um, that's, that's good. Well, what about their role in financial stability? The whole point about financial stability is you can't trust an agency that is subject to political um, influence to take the unpopular action of leaning against um, excessive credit um, expansion. If we, if we think that financial stability in the central bank should be insulated from politics, why don't we think um, um, financial stability in securities regulators should be insulated from politics? My, my best guess is that there will be a crisis in securities in the governance of securities regulation. I've got no idea whether it's 20 years away or, or three years away. So a few, how long have I got left, Charles? Oh, as long as you want. No, 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 these, these, are, uh, these are citizens, seriously. Uh, 15 minutes. Oh my goodness, thank you. Um, I'll say a bit about central banking. Um, so that, that my book initially, um, in my mind at least, was called Over Mighty Citizens. And, and Sarah Curry, who's sitting at the back, who's my editor from, from Princeton, persuaded me that this wasn't um, the best title, and, and she was right. But it will work in this room, where there are lots of British people. It's an echo, of course, of the overmighty citizens of, of well, the overmighty subjects of late medieval um, England, who toppled uh, um, a king and caused a crisis of legitimacy, which we call the Wars of the Roses and the Tudor um, period. Um, so, are my, are my former colleagues and successors in the Federal Reserve, the ECB, um, in the Bank of Japan, are they, are they over mighty citizens? <laughs>
Well, interestingly, the, the debate that is underway isn't just about the powers that they have accrued, the financial stability um, powers, the banking regulatory powers, insurance regulatory powers. It is about um, the basis for monetary independence it, itself. And th th this is, I mean, pe people at the, at the fringes of economics and politics have, have always argued this. It's, it's now a reasonably mainstream view. This is, this is Larry Summers. He's, he's said this in other places. I think this is his most eloquent statement of his position, which um, I got him to make in an email um, to me and is quoted at, uh, at the chapter head, at the head of one of the chapters of my book. Central bank independence had a specific justification. Monetary policy was thought to have major dynamic consistency issues and did not have much non-technical political content. In today's world, where the dominant problem is too little or not, not too much inflation, the dynamic consistency argument loses its force. And the greater salience of exchange rate issues, fiscal monetary cooperation, and credit allocation aspects of monetary policy draws it closer to policy normally delegated to democratic institutions. So at a minimum, central bank independence needs reconsideration and it's possible that it can no longer be justified in its current form. And we, we, this should be taken seriously, not only because Larry is a serious and very influential person, but because this isn't the only voice at that level of, of policy making and, and economics to be airing thoughts of, of, of this kind. Now, as it happens, I, I am unpersuaded by Larry's argument, essentially for two reasons um, which perhaps come together. The, the, what lies behind it is a kind of rather narrow view of a credible commitment problem, that it has to be uh, a problem of dynamic inconsistency and that in monetary um, economics, the problem manifests itself in an upward inflation bias. Now you take yourself back to the beginning of 1990 when we, as I then was, embarked on um, bringing interest rates down to zero doing QE on a massive scale, and think about how that hasn't been popular with all parts of the community, perhaps especially in Germany and in parts of the United States. If you look at, at debates in and around the US Congress, there are, there are people for whom QE has been deeply um, unpopular, not, not, not for the cr crazy kind of it will lead to runaway inflation, but because actually it's hurt savers relying on income from savings. And I think it's plausible to believe that had, had we had political monetary policy, that there would not have been the scale of intervention, monetary intervention, that was necessary in order to um, avoid the vortex um, that, that threatened a repeat of the Great Depression. I also think it's possible that had they tried to do QE on the scale of the Federal Reserve or the Bank of England or the ECB, they wouldn't have succeeded because they wouldn't have been um, trusted not to go too far and try and inflate away some of their, their debt. And as yields rose rather than come down, that would have kind of undone the effects of the QE. But there is also a constitutionalist argument, um, which is that um, I've ended up thinking of monetary independence as a corollary of the separation of powers, because the monetary instrument is latently, latently always an instrument of taxation. How much inflation should you allow? Should you allow bursts of unexpected inflation, um, which both set both the steady state rate of the inflation tax and distribute resources between creditors and um, debtors? The last people on this view um, who you should delegate the monetary instrument to are the elected executive branch, because they are precisely the people that Simon de Montfort and Madison and Montesquieu and others said should not control the tax um, instrument. Now, one, one way through that is to have a committee of the legislature decide monetary policy. That's not real, realistic and probably unconstitutional in the United States. Another would be to have a, a commodity standard like the, the, like the gold um, standard. And in a sense, I now think of the gold standard as itself a constitutional um, measure. But I think we, since full franchise democracy, I don't think we live in societies that are prepared to tolerate the volatility um, in output and jobs that is entailed um, by something like the gold standard. And for those of you that has followed the history of the Bank of England over the past hundred years, I think this was Montague Norman's um, fatal blindness that he brought up 
at the end of the 19th century, at the beginning of the 20th century, he didn't understand that full franchise democracy was, was different. So all you're left with is, well, can we have this other bunch of people, but can we constrain them sufficiently and incentivize them sufficiently that they will not use it as an instrument of taxation, but will pursue the objective that we um, give them? Um, now, th those are kind of normative arguments um, for central bank um, independence. There's an interesting question about why anyone should ever bother us to make um, central banks independence, independent. Now, and, the, and the standard political science view has it almost the wrong way around, or, or at least I think is, is too assertive in its, in its universalism. The standard argument is that political parties have constituents, um, constituencies that they, that, they, that they feed. I mean backers and supporters. Uh, I don't mean people living in, in electoral districts. Um, and that parties of the right will um, generally be supported by and try and serve people in finance. And finance doesn't like um, inflation. Um, and therefore, parties of the right will tend to favor central bank independence as a way of locking in low and stable um, inflation. And I think this has it almost the wrong way around, at least for this country, in that why would you want to um, lock in low inflation? If, you, cause you, if, you're, if you're in government, and there are, there are former politicians and cabinet ministers in the room, I, I shouldn't think any of them think they're going to be in government forever. They think their party will eventually lose. And the question is, how quickly can you get back? If, you, if you're the party of the right and you think that actually you, you are going to be less likely to go on inflationary spurges because you prefer a smaller state and so on. I'm not making a normative point about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. You think, well, we will eventually lose power, but the other side are much more likely to mess up um, monetary policy, which will help bring us back into, into power. We don't want to lock in our successors. Um, so it's, on, on this account, it is of no surprise that the Bank of England gets its independence from the Labour Party, not from the Tory Party. Because what does the Labour Party want to do? It wants to protect itself from precisely its own um, predilections for a larger state. And by the way, there are other examples. At a very interesting point in Italian history, the Italian Communist Party, which was a serious force in Italian politics, um, backed um, increasing the independence or insulation from politics of the of the banker to tell you. Now, there's another story about why the right shouldn't then repeal it when they get in, and we could talk about that in, in, in questions. Now, um, five more minutes? Yeah. OK. Um, going on to, on to all the new powers, there's a kind of implicit in a lot of macro finance literature and macro finance economist talk is the crisis has revealed that there are missing instruments. Um, these missing instruments need to be used with credibility. The only body um, that has both the expertise and can make credible commitments is the central bank, and therefore we ought to give these instruments to the central bank. And, and you will realize that I think this um, is, is, is wrong. I think it's, not, not, it's wrong in terms of of legitimacy. Um, but some expansion of central bank powers beyond the narrow monetary institute, monetary policy function, is, I think, um, inevitable. And it's inevitable because our societies have chosen to allow banking, private banking, what economists call um, fractional reserve banking. I think there are fairly good reasons for that in terms of taking government out of the allocation of of, of credit, um, but these entities are fragile and they can suffer runs. So enter the um, central banker as the lender of last resort. The lender of last resort function is essentially a reinsurance um, function. And the central bank cannot avoid being the liquidity reinsurer, as the Bank of England discovered in the summer of 2007. Um, and where a function um, is inevitably held, on my view, it should be formalized. So for what it's worth, the lender of last resort function in this country is not formalized. Um, responsibility for it still lies in the person of the governor. There is no objective for it. It's just a thing that the, that the central bank can do. Actually, there is a power now for the Treasury to order the Bank of England to do some lender of last resort. It would have been much better 
um, if Parliament had given the Bank of England an objective subject to constraints. In the United States, there are lots of constraints, but there's barely an objective. When I say that in the States, central bankers and former central bankers say, no, there is an objective. It's in the 1913 Act. It's to maintain an elastic currency. Well, you do not want to be an unelected person with an objective that is incomprehensible um, to almost everybody you've ever met, other than the people that you happen to work with. And actually, the people, most people I work with wouldn't have understood what that meant. Um, so here is, here is, if you only ever read one speech on central banking in your whole life, um, and there's a lot to be said for only reading one, um, this is the one you should read. Um, Paul Volcker's speech, The Triumph of Central Banking, question mark. The question mark got emphasized a lot in, in Q&A, and it was given um, just a few years after he, um, after he retired. And I, and I remember reading this when he gave it, and you know, if only we'd all inhaled it. I insist that neither monetary policy nor the financial system will be well served if a central bank loses interest in or influence over the financial system. Now, th this is not some cheap reference to the Bank of England, although I think it applies to the Bank of England. I think the Greenspan Fed didn't have much interest in the financial regulatory functions of the Fed. Um, and the, and the point here is that if the lender of last resort is inevitably um, or invariably at the scene of financial crises and disasters, as I assert that it is, well, then it needs information to judge the soundness of potential borrowers. Um, and actually, it will want to influence policy on the resilience requirements imposed upon banks and to be assured that supervision is, is professional. And I don't, that, that makes the case for the central bank um, being... The being a supervisor. I don't think it makes a case for the central bank being the only supervisor. And Mervyn was good enough when this was being debated um, in Britain after 2010, when the Tory government came in. He said, we won't take these functions back, or we'll try and resist them unless the three of us, Charlie and I and, and Mervyn, agreed. And this was why I thought we had to go down this route, and why I had thought it was a mistake to take it away. But there's another point which kind of draws on legitimacy. The Bank of Japan and the Bundesbank um, do this informally. Um, I, in fact, the Bundesbank are famous for arguing that the central bank should not be the bank supervisor, which actually deeply is because of the constitutional provision in the basic law that I referred to earlier, which is why I refer to that constitutional provision. And on the whole, they don't own up to this until you put it to them. But I once asked, a former president of the Bundesbank, probably the dominant president of the Bundesbank over the past 30 or 40 years, why um, he had opposed being the bank supervisor. And he said it's really important not to be accountable um, for it, to take responsibility for it, because it would pollute our um, accountability for monetary policy. And I, uh, and I responded, actually, I responded less bluntly than I feel I should have done. Sometimes one should be more blunt. Um, and I think I should have been that evening over, over dinner. He was a much bigger man than me. Um, I mean, in central banking, I don't, I don't mean physically. Um, a rather, rather slight man, um, physically. Is that you, might, you imagine that in this country, or in the United States of America, or actually in most healthy, healthy democracies. We're responsible, but because it's not laid down in, formally, somehow we can be shielded from um, accountability. This is, this is a way to lose the trust of the people. When I asked, I'm lucky enough to know virtually every living um, Bundesbank president or former president, and many of them are good friends of mine. And I asked all of them whether they ever testified to the Bundestag on monetary policy. And they, and they said, no, no, we, we don't do that. We go on and talk about other things, but to testify on monetary policy would undermine um, our independence. Well, my view was, and I'm sure Charlie's view was, and I'm absolutely certain that Eddie's view was, even though he's not with us, and I know for sure that Mervyn's view, is that testifying was what underpinned our independence. It didn't undermine our independence at all. And, and here's a story, and I'll perhaps end with, with this and then go on to something about self-restraint. But I don't think you were there, Charlie, and forgive me if you were. Mervyn and I, and perhaps some others, were once testifying to the select committee, and George Moody, who was then the ranking member, um, so the senior Labour Party politician on the, um, on the Treasury Committee, said to us, I, I quote this in ex exact words at the beginning of one of the chapters, so Mr. King, Mr. Tucker, you come along, you come along here, 
and we ask you questions, and you, you give eloquent answers, and then you go back, and it, it, none of it makes any difference at all. What is the point of, what is the point of, of, of this? And um, Mervyn answered first, and then I was asked to answer as well, and we both said the same thing, um, and it amounted to, you, Parliament, have made us independent, and it is our duty to obey the law and to go back and make the judgments that we believe are right. And these sessions are partly about you deciding whether or not to sustain that independence. And if you take it away or you qualify it or you reform it, that's that. It's not for us here to defend the independence, it's, but, it, but it is also not for us to go back to our building and behave, and behave as though we haven't got the independence that a sovereign parliament gave us. We didn't use the sovereign parliament words. I'm, I'm doing that now for pompous effect. But um, let me talk about self-restraint. Um, so here are th I'm going to end with this. Here are three quotes that compare the military and the judiciary and central banking. And um, there's a bit of me that worries I included these quotes in the book just because they're so great. But I, I, think, I think they're relevant to something I feel very strongly about because they bring out the difference between these three fields. So the first one is the most remarkable. It, it's it's um, Field Marshal Alan Brook, who was chief of the Imperial General Staff during the Second World War, a truly, truly great man. Um, at the end of a day where he and Churchill had had a row that lasted um, virtually all of the day, and someone goes to see um, um, Brooke, actually some, somebody who's not insignificant in, in, in his own right, who went on to become the leader of NATO later. And he says to Brooke, um, the old man hates you. The old, no, the old man thinks you hate him. The old man thinks you hate him. This is in 1944. And Brooke says, and apparently he cried when he said this, I don't hate him, I do love him. But the day that I say that I agree with him when I don't is the day he must get rid of me because I am no use to him anymore. I mean, I find this incredibly moving. And this is, you know, before D-Day. I mean, this is, you know, this is big stuff. The, the next is Alexander Bickel. Not everybody in the room will know who Alexander Bickel um, was. He was a very, very distinguished um, constitutional lawyer at um, Yale and wrote a very famous book at the beginning of the 1960s called The Least Dangerous Branch, which coined the expression um, the counter-majoritarian problem. And he said, the justices have, have their being near the political marketplace in which the effects of their judgments are felt. A number of controls are built into their craft which they must practice under the scrutiny of a profession whose expectations and approval must matter to them. So in there you have professional standing and gestures to public standing. And here is Mervyn King um, at a retirement dinner given in London, in fact, for uh, Jean-Claude Trichet in public. I don't think Bourbon's remarks were um, published, but I wrote these down and I checked them with him when I was writing the book. Central bank governors require three qualities above all. A deep commitment to price stability, which I would make monetary system stability, an ability to be clear and direct to politicians about the policies that are required to produce economic stability, and the ability to be unpopular when circumstances require. So, Although my book is largely about the formal design of agencies, I actually think you can't write down a complete contract. Self-restraint is important as well. And what you want to code into the framework is something that is suggestive of the self-restraint um, that a particular um, part of unelected, a whole particular branch of unelected power um, should, should follow. And we all know that the military and the judiciary um, have clear codes of self-restraint developed over um, decades and hundreds of years. So here are some self-restraining precepts for central bankers. Like the military, but unlike the judiciary, the central bankers must be ready to advise in private on the wider government policies that are necessary for monetary system stability. You can't have judges popping in to see the prime minister or the president to have a chat about policy. Um, but central bank governors can, can do that. Unlike the military, precisely because they have job security, they must not press and press while not um, equivocating in their advice. So Brooke could press and press precisely because Churchill could get out of bed or in the middle of the day say, I've had it, Alan, just, just you know, you've finished. And of course, he famously did that with Dill and replaced Dill with um, 
um, Brook. I mentioned Dill, by the way, because more British citizens should know about Dill. Um, governors should not do that, or well, central bankers should not do that. The, the chair of the Federal Reserve, or Mario Draghi, should not do that, because, precisely because they can't be sacked. Unlike the military, they can repeat this advice in public at their own initiative. But in doing so, the intimate connection with their formal mandate must be explicit and able to withstand tough scrutiny. I talk in the book about um, my friend Janet Yellen talking about inequality in Boston without pulling it back to the Federal Reserve's mission, about my friend Raghu Rajan talking in India about the importance of tolerance, which I think was, which was taken to be code for Hindus should be nice to Muslims, um, but without relating it to the central banks. Mission. So th there's a lot built into that. Um, and it, it's crystallized here. Central bankers cannot be in the business of offering their opinion in private or in public on things they happen to know about or interested in, but do not rely upon in fulfilling the trust placed in them by legislators. By being given the great gift of these powers, the extraordinary privilege um, it is to have the, occupy the positions that some of us have occupied, you, you, you volunteer to give up something. You give up by, precisely by being given a public platform. You, have, you can't use it except for the mission that you've been given. Like the judiciary, they must not be drawn into offering specific private advice or public remarks about things they will or might have to decide. Like the judiciary as legitimacy seekers, they can and rationally ought to explain their institution to the public. Those of you that live in this country will have seen our Supreme Court justices talk much more about the, the value and nature of Supreme Court independence, about the limits of the, of the common law over the, um, whereas Denning's generation wouldn't really do so. Perhaps Denning was the transition. Um, like the judiciary, they must be ready to take um, criticism. The, 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 the answer, to, to being, not being over mighty citizens is to internalize um, the values of democracy and the rule of, of law. These people um, in the Federal Reserve and the ECB in the Bank of Japan, they need to be in their very soul, unelected Democrats. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that splendid lecture. We now have a chance to a period of questions and answers. Uh, please, please give your name. I know you, but still give your name and who you are. Uh, you, Nick. Uh, Nicholas Beale from SciTeb. Paul, thank you very much for that extremely thought-provoking and very interesting talk, and I think we all look forward to reading it at more length in the book. Um, my question concerns multiple objectives. Yeah. I can see absolutely that an agency with a single objective is much tidier and much easier to deal with than multiple objectives. But the world is actually full of problems where you have multiple objectives and yeah. complex trade-offs. You know, it's one of the reasons AI isn't going to take over the world anytime soon is because AI is really good at single objectives and terrible at multiple objectives. I can see also that if there is going to be a trade-off, there needs to be some level of a democratic accountability, such as, for example, towards a select committee. But it's not clear to me that just because there are multiple objectives, it's automatically better for politicians to take the decisions than to have responsible, well-governanced, independent agencies doing so. Could you elaborate on that? Well, I so thanks, Nick. Um, <coughs> I'm going to use this as an excuse to say something about multiple missions. Um, so I think if, if, if a body has multiple objectives and nothing is said about how to trade off, how to weight those objectives, or where there are short or long-term trade-offs, how to trade them off, then they're setting high policy. And people could disagree about this. My view is that um, unelected people shouldn't um, um, set high policy, and you, and you see this in the United States with the SEC, which is not an independent agency, on my definition. There is a big, big swing um, in SEC policy, announced um, publicly by Jay Clayton, who I've got to know a bit, the new SEC um, chair. I think that's fine precisely because the SEC um, isn't independent. But imagine that they were completely insulated from politics and they come into work and they say, well, we're gonna, we've, we've, we've had a rethink. Um, some, some, someone's done some really good research. 
we, we thought um, we were going to kind of put investor protection there and capital formation there, but actually growth's come down, we, we, we should do it the other way around. And my response to that, which may not be the same as yours, is um, I want Virginia to take um, decisions like that, not me, not me. Um, not least because, I mean, both because of our political values and also because I don't know how to monitor the success of an unelected person who might shift the weighting between their objectives. How do I know whether they're even trying, let alone being a success? Whereas Virginia, I can go and do that amazing thing, stick a tick in a, um, in a box. The multiple mission thing, I think, is more profound, which is, um, and of course, directly relevant to central bankers that are also regulators and financial stability people. And here, two political, two both um, research in political science and research in economics shows how big a problem this is. Wilson's book, Bureaucracy, which is a wonderful book, I don't know, 40, 50 years ago, documented how agencies with two missions will prioritize the one um, that is more salient. They'll put more effort. With a, with a limited amount of effort you can use, you put more effort into um, um, the more salient one. And some years later, Ben Holmstrom and Paul Milgram um, formalized this. But what they, what they do in their formal model is they assume the decision taker is the same. And the, 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 the multiple committee structure of the Bank of England, I promise you, is a result of this. The, the solution is, first of all, do the, are these missions so closely intertwined that you will get better results from having them, I'm going to say, in the same um, building? That, that, that itself requires debate. Once you've put them in the safe, same building, how do you solve the incentives problem? And the solution, I believe, is to have separate committees for each mission, a monetary policy committee, a financial policy committee, a prudential regulation board, um, each which has a majority of members who are on that policy committee and not on any other policy um, committee, and where the minority of members who are on, um, in that case, on two committees, or in some cases even on three committees, th their role is to kind of ins ensure that information flows to everybody and to ensure um, basic um, joined upness. It, it's, it's, by the way, a, a, a role, it becomes a role that is closer to that of being a Supreme Court justice, one of coordination rather than one of policy um, leadership, um, which I think is quite important. Michael, say and say who you are. Well, they were. Some most of us know. Well, uh, I'm Michael no, Bordo. No, who, who, who you are? Where you come from? <laughs> I'm Michael Bordo at Rutgers University, former student of this place. Okay, uh, uh, Paul, this is a this is kind of a really old question, but you know, in 1962, Friedman wrote this. Milton Friedman wrote this article. Uh, in a book by Leland Yeager on, uh, on, on, on constitutions. And he was very critical of the Federal Reserve's independence. And he said, listen, this is an institution that was independent, and what did it bring us? It brought us the Great Depression. Okay, it should become basically just, you know, it should just be an office in the basement of the Treasury that prints money. Okay, now a point he was making was that ideas and doctrine are really important. And if you have an institution like a central bank and they're following a wrong model, which then was the real bills doctrine, okay, we could make arguments that many people here wouldn't agree with me, like in the 1960s, following Keynesian doctrine and the Phillips curve, okay, then what do you do about that? If you're independent, how does, how does, how is that, how does a, an independent institution in a democracy, how is, how is this rectified? So I think it's a great challenge. I think it was in the same year that he may have testified um, to Congress and, and asked the question, um, should the Federal Reserve be a fourth branch of, of, of government? Maybe that was later. But anyway, he, he kept up this for, for, for many years, as you know better than, than me. Well, I haven't said it out this evening, but I think as you, you need um, and this can't be a sufficient um, um, solution to your problem. You need sufficient consensus that the kind of underlying model or theory um, 
um, works. The, the, uh, an area that's contested at the level of objectives, which I did talk about, but even at the, at the level of means, you just can't delegate. But you also need some kind of means for the politicians to, to intervene. Now, I think for the United States, the hurdles for having an in independent agency should be higher than in parliamentary democracies, given the difficulties of, of, of reversing um, delegations to independent agencies. And so what we see, tend to see in the United States, including in the period before that, is something which in a sense is uncomfortable, which is that de jure independence is maintained and de facto um, um, independence um, becomes suborned. And, and just because it might interest other people in the room, this, this reaches ahead um, in, the, in the early 1970s, in the run-up to the 1972 presidential election, where there is a meeting between Arthur Burns, chairman of the Federal Reserve, and, and President Nixon, and people know exactly the words used because of what everyone calls the Nixon tapes, the kind of Watergate um, tapes. And, and one, of, one of these two people um, says during the course of one of these meetings, um, um, time's getting on, meaning the election's getting close. We better get this economy going. It is Arthur Burns who says that, um, not, not President Nixon. Now, he was under, he was under immense pressure because they were spreading all sorts of horrible rumors about him. But um, it's, it's, this, I think, goes to the need for transparency. It, but I don't, want, I don't want to disagree with you. I think if it goes horribly wrong, I think it has to be possible. I think the Federal Reserve defends its independence as though it's its to defend. And I don't actually believe that. Um, and I think unless there's a, an underlying theory or model that, that um, works tolerably well and commands sufficient support across a broad expert community, then it's pretty hopeless um, insulating a public policy area from elected politics. Kevin James from the Systemic Risk Center. Going back to your legitimacy matrix, it's very hard to see how a financial market regulator could ever be legitimate and independent given their range of missions, the very, for how hard it is to define what success would mean, and the inevitable policy and distributional trade-offs that are involved in, in this financial regulation. So do you think you could have an independent financial regulator, or is the SEC kind of version of delegated um, governments the right one? So at the current state of knowledge, I agree, which is why I think the SEC solution is not a bad one at all. Um, something I was struck by in talking to CFT, CFTC chairs I've known and one in particular, and um, SEC chairs, was how sensitive they were to swings in congressional opinion. Um, maybe the state of knowledge about these trade-offs will be greater um, someday. But it does leave this problem with, um, with their financial stability um, role. I mean, a, a, that's a really big um, problem. Now, the solution in this country, and again, I was part of this, was to give the FPC, the macro prudential body, a, a right and I'm going to, there's an allusion here, a right to kind of direct or make, comply or explain recommendations to the, to the, to the market um, regulator, which, is, which schematically is a way of carving out that function and giving it a bit more, giving it a bit more um, independence. But I, I, I mean, my point about this country, I haven't said this this evening, I, it's in the book and I've, I've said it on other occasions in London, this country has become casual about where power lies. And, and I am, I am um, and, I, and I think that's much more apparent, by the way, around the, the, the various offs than um, with, the, with the FCA. I mean, the, the offs all happen because they seem to have the same kind of time consistency problem um, because of infrastructure investment that monetary policy has, and indeed they do, but not nearly as much care was taken with framing the objective or the kind of remit um, system. And to give, it, to give an interesting example about how this plays out in day-to-day -day life, real life, whereas the remit to the MPC is always signed by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, um, the, the, the physical examples or on, the, or on the web I've been able to find of the remit to the, to the Competition and Markets Authority are signed by a junior minister. And, and some junior ministers are quite potent, but sometimes junior ministers in this system are not as potent as senior civil servants. I mean, it's secretaries of state that sit at the cabinet table in our system of government who are potent. So I think there is symbolic significance 
in the CMA's remit being um, signed by a junior minister. And for what it's worth, in the great sweep of the years ahead in this country, I suspect that the CMA is going to be more important than the Bank of England. The back. Uh, Dr. Keith Postler. Um, Nay, sorry. Dr. Keith Postler. Um, LSE PhD and um, sometime guest lecturer here. Um, could you comment on um, the role and perhaps the power of the National Audit Office? Oh. Um, I think that might be interesting in this context because it's unelected, but yet it's supposed to have some oversight. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, comment on the power of the GAO, the Government Accounting Office in the United States of America, which is broadly analogous, but helps me, avoids me delving too much into the government intricacies of the country of which I'm a citizen, which is more comfortable for me. So in the United States, there has been a proposal. It's passed as legislation in the House a few times, um, but not yet the Senate, um, that the GAO ought to have um, the power um, to audit the Fed after every monetary policy um, decision, and, and or actually on a motion that either the House or Senate could pass, it would audit it. And of course, the Fed have, have hugely opposed um, this, and I have challenged them a bit, and I'm half persuaded. It's the frequency of it. If you had every single monetary policy decision um, um, challenged and subject to a GAO review, you would find yourself in a const constantly relitigating whether the decisions you've taken were the right ones, where actually the whole beauty of monetary policy, which makes it so much less controversial than regulatory policy, is you, I think, you, 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 you have eight goes a year. I mean, monetary, as a monetary policy maker, you don't try to make mistakes, for God's sake, you try very hard, but if you do um, make mistakes, you, you get an early chance to reverse them, and the worst you've um, suffered is a little bit of professional um, embarrassment. You never do that much damage to your country. It's the, the, the monetary mistakes that really cost are the kinds that uh, Michael was referring to, where the underlying theory is, 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 um, is wrong. And so the, re the reason I give you that answer is I don't, I don't think there's a generic question, a generic answer to the question of the role of um, the NAO or the GAO um, in this area. I think there's a very interesting question, which I only allude to in the book, about how they should fit into the constitutional structure. I mean, I, I describe central banks and independent regulators as trustees, whereas I think electoral commissions in many countries are a fourth branch. They are guardians of the democratic system itself. And I think that countries um, have been pretty careless about that, and I think we've got all sorts of auditing bodies of all sorts of things now, and quite how they fit into the constitutional structure has been left vague. In fact, um, here's a swipe, I'm afraid. If you, if you read the best books in this country about the shifts in the constitutionalism, they are all about devolution or reform in the House of Lords or, or creating the Supreme Court out of the Judicial Committee of the House of Lords. There's almost nothing about independent um, agent agencies or the various audit bodies that we now have. And um, that's a shame. In white shirt behind. I'm Oliver Bush, Bank of England and LSE. Um, I was interested in your uh, mention a of how- fine, A fine tradition, if I may say so. <laughs> Indeed, well, you, you have to say that. <laughs> Um, I, no, no, I, I, don't, I don't have to say anything. It's what I, it's what I, it's that like. um, so, so I was interested by, by your, your statement earlier on that you have to ensure there's sufficient expertise outside of the independent mm. agencies as well as inside. And I, I'd be interested in your thoughts on whose responsibility it is to ensure that's the case and, and how they should carry out that well, well, you can't, well, you can't create expertise. I mean, if Virginia's sitting there, she's the Treasury Minister, and I go with a proposal to create a... Um, um, an independent agency, and she says, "Are there enough experts?" And I say, "No, but I was rather hoping, Minister, that you could you could um, generate some." And she says, "Oh, I'll do that." And I say, "Yes, Minister." Um, it's it's rather the other way around. I, I I go and I say there should be this independent agency, 
And Virginia says, um, well, you know, how many people really know about this in this country? And I said, well, there's kind of me and um, my mates. That's about eight. And, you know, she should say no. She should say no. It's the responsibility it is never with the technocrats for none of the big things. It is always with the people that um, we elect. Now, of course, this matters because of the political science of this, the incentives. The minister, um, and this is particularly so in the United States, but here, they have incentives to say, oh, yes, lovely idea, lovely idea. Shed blame, shed blame. Doesn't work quite so well here, but it works a bit. Works fantastically well in the United States. So one of the, we're in this, um, I mean, the United States, I think, has a really deep problem of incentives, values, and compatibility. The Congress has incentives to, sh to, to, to delegate with very vague objectives and lots of powers. The court has incentives not to strike that out, which is why they've abandoned the substance of the non-delegation doctrine from the 1930s, because otherwise they bring government to a halt. So it's incentive compatible for the two key players. The president's going to sign it off. I could describe her or his incentives um, as well. Is that compatible with our values? No, it isn't. And this has nothing to do with the 2016 presidential election. We are in an equilibrium where there may not be incentives, values, compatibility. Um, in the American system of, of government. In fact, I think in some ways, I think that's the most important thing I say in the book. If you pass it forward, there we are. Uh, thank you, Richard Bacon. I'm the Member of Parliament for South Norfolk. Um, I wasn't going to ask you a question, Paul, but um, you did mention the National Audit Office in your answer, and in fact, immediately slid onto the subject of the GAO, and I think in your own words, to avoid answering it, because it was a little more comfortable. So um, <clears throat> at the risk of making you feel less comfortable, um, I've spent 16 years, I'm now off the committee, watching, yes. Yes. watching the National Order Office very closely as a member of the Select Committee on Public Accounts. I'm also a member of the Public Accounts Commission, a parliamentary select committee separate from the PAC, which uh, provides the budget for the National Audit Office. I have also visited the GAO, the Tribunal de Thuentas, the Bundesverfassungsgericht, the Cour de Comptes, the Turkish Court of Auditors, and others. And my impression, wherever I go, um, is that indeed, in their different ways, uh, supreme audit institutions are, to a greater or lesser extent, seen as uh, fourth branches of government. The way they, they operate is very different in different places. but. I wanted to ask you particularly about, because um, you said you, think, you thought you didn't have the expertise to monitor the performance of uh, unelected people. I think that that's what I was doing on the PAC for 16 years. Where, of no, course I do we, think you have, I uh, do think you have yes, the skill to do it. Yes, but, 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 the, the, but the, I don't think that the, either the public accounts, so I don't think the Public Accounts Commission, or certainly not the National Audit Office, would meet your test of independence as an independent agency. Yet, um, having watched it very closely, I think it is, to a very large extent, uh, de facto independent in, in a, a really quite real way, and uh, g government fears it. Um, the CNAG, who is independent and unsackable uh, to all intents, no, no, uh, largely unsackable, um, uh, will, I know for a fact, refuse to meet ministers t uh, since he thinks it will compromise his independence. So I, I'm just wondering whether you've talked a lot about principles and values. I'm just wondering how much of the, the actual independence, in fact, is less down to what's written down and to what is uh, actually cultural uh, and to what's more specifically not written down. Because I, I think that gets probably to the heart of whether these institutions actually work properly or not. So, so I'll only say one thing on the NAO, and maybe we could pick this up um, later. I mean I, I mean, I guess I've got about 30... I don't know, 1989 onwards involvement with the NAO. I think the, f I think the head of the NAO being at the last job of their career is tremendously um, important. Indeed, something I say in, this, in the book about the heads of independent agencies generally, I think they're so powerful. This is particularly true, I think, central banks. It, it, I think central banks and other really powerful independent agencies should be more like supreme courts. Well, that, that, that's it. You serve, you serve late. And you don't serve late because, because you're wiser or anything like that. You, you serve late because you're not in the game for anything, anything else. That that's, that that's it. Um, and so the specificities of this, I mean, I say much more in the book than, um, than I could set out this evening. And I, and I do discuss practical issues and cultural issues. Um, a bit, and I couldn't agree more, but the, 
but I do think that those cultural things, they're not orthogonal to the formal framework. And where they are, the polity has a, um, a deeper um, um, problem. So I, I can go along with everything you've just said. I'm afraid I think it's time is passing, and I'm afraid I must now wrap it up. So can we please, um, but, but before I do so, um, I'm going to get Paul to stay here for a little bit, and those who want to buy the book, if they hurry and come back and get Paul to autograph it. But um, apart from that, we must wrap up here, and this gives us a chance to thank Paul very much for what has been a splendid evening. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you all very much.